bunch of people in Birmingham today, and it did not even cross their mind to come to church. Do you know that? It wasn't even on their radar. They're eating Frosted Flakes right now, or they're at Target. They're still in their jammies. They're watching NFL Live, getting ready for the playoffs today. I don't, they're just doing something. And they didn't come. So I already know something about you just by the simple fact that you are here, that your faith is really important to you. Because there, there are some people that it's just not on their mind to even come to church because they're not really sure that faith is a priority in their life. And for, but for, that's not you. Because you could have been doing something else today. You could like be doing brunch, you know? I, I'm a preacher, so I don't know what people do on Sunday mornings besides go to church. So I hear people do brunch. Is that true? Right? So you could be doing brunch. You could be doing a million other things. But by you being here today... I know something about you. Your faith is a priority. You want your faith to grow. You want your faith to get stronger. In fact, for some of you, just being here is kind of a new thing. Today, you're here for the first time, or you've been a handful of times, and just being here is you're re-engaging with your faith. You're making your faith a priority. You, you decided in 2020 you were going to come back to church, and, and we want to help you own the decade in your faith, or, or you decided you're going to get plugged back in. So we're just so glad you're here that you've decided to make faith a new priority in your life. Some of you are here every Sunday and you've been doing this for years or it, it might not have been in this church, but there was another church and, but you just, you don't know Sundays without worship. And I'm so grateful that you're here because I, faith has been a priority for you for a long time. So I'm just so grateful for that. So today, since I know that about you, that your faith is a priority, I want to talk about how you make your faith grow. Like how do you, this is the way I would describe it. How do you get it from point A to point B? Right? Like, do you have a B in mind? Like in 2030, this is where I'd like to be. You might even have a picture in mind of somebody, like somebody whose character and who their, their faith, your respect. Do you, do you have somebody like that, a small group leader, a grandmother, or a great uncle that you're just like, I want to be like them when I grow up? And I want my faith to be like them, and I want to love Jesus the way they do. And you, so you would just say, you know, I would be great if I could get from the point I'm at now, point A, to point B by 2030. I mean, so here's some questions about that. So we're going to talk about how to get from A to B, how to get from where you're at to where you want to go, the kind of, the kind of person of faith that you would imagine yourself, like if you could just do it right, that you would become. So, but I want to ask a couple questions. What is... Uh, how long have you been at point A? Have you been kind of in a holding pattern for a few years? Like just kind of just settling, just kind of steady where you're at, but you haven't made a lot of progress in your faith. You still believe the same things, but you also kind of struggle with the same things or doing the same things, and you, you, there's not more depth, more progress. Uh, the, the other question I would ask is what, what even is A for you? I want to, and the reason that that's important it's because today, the scripture passage that we're going to read goes on the assumption that point A is a follower of Jesus. It's written to Christians. And that's really important because some of you here today may not have even made it to A. You're, you're back here trying to figure out if A is for you. And we're so grateful that you came. I mean, you're, you're just like I said, you're here because you're curious or you're, you're interested in Jesus. You're unsure, but you're interested or you're seeking and searching for what, what faith might have to do in your life, what God, how much of God you want in your life. You're, you're just curious and we're so grateful. Today's message is going to be for people who have made a decision and would consider themselves Christians. So if that's not you, could I just take just a minute just to talk to just you? Just the people in the room that would say, I'm not sure where I'm at with faith, but I, I don't know that, I, I'm not sure I would consider myself a Christian. I want to tell you something, that we exist for you. In fact, our purpose for you, we built this building for you. Everything we do is for people like you so that you would know that not only that Jesus loves you, but that he died for you. And I want to tell you why that is such good news. A lot of people are really confused about God. A lot of people think that you have to do good things to get God's attention and to go to heaven. And so we try to do good things to get God's attention to go to heaven because good people go to heaven, right? That's what a lot of people think. And so good people should go to church because we think there's some good people there. We've got 
three or four here at least, right? But that's not the way it works at all. Did you know that? That's not the story that this book, what, what we call the Bible, tells about Jesus. In fact, it says that God became human in Jesus and came to earth, not to just, sh because none of us are good enough. So, so the bad news is if you're thinking you came today because you're trying to do some good things to get God's attention, I've got bad news for you. You're a sinner. You're not good enough. The good news is the person next to you who's been in church their whole life is also a sinner and they're not good enough. You are surrounded by people who are sinners and not good enough to go to heaven and not good enough to be in a relationship with God. But God didn't come to earth in Jesus just to show us what a good human could look like. He came to take the punishment that we deserve for our sins by dying for us on the cross so that we could have forgiveness for those sins. And we know this to be true because three days later, he actually rose from the dead. And we don't believe that just because it's written in a book. Because what is written in this book are accounts from people who were around Jesus and eyewitnesses. We believe it, not because it's in a book, because Matthew was an eyewitness and he wrote about it. And because John was an eyewitness and he wrote about it. Because Peter was an eyewitness and he wrote about it. Because the, the apostle Paul experienced Jesus in an incredible way after his resurrection and he wrote about it. And Mark wrote about it. And a man named Luke wrote about it. And James, Jesus. Jesus' own brother was convinced that his brother was the resurrected son of God. And almost all of them gave their lives for what they believed and what they wrote. Don't you think just one of them would go, whoa, 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 before you cut my head off, I was just kidding. They couldn't. Because what they had experienced and seen in Jesus was so real that they believed that they knew what they had seen with their own two eyes and experienced in their heart that Jesus truly was resurrected from the dead. And his resurrection gave us final victory over sin and death. And we can get eternal life on this earth and in the life to come, not by doing good things, but by something amazing we call grace. It's free. And check this out, check this out. If you're not to A yet, and you're like, how do I get to A? I'm curious. All you have to do is believe. That's it. The people sitting around you who would say, I'm a follower of Jesus or I'm a Christian, the difference between you and them isn't that they're better or they've done something good or they've got their life straightened out. The only difference between you and them is that they, at some point in their life, made a choice to believe just that. And in church world, we got a word for that. It's called saved. They got saved. Now, we're going old school today, right? <laughs> Talking about folks getting saved. It's like a Christian buzzword. And we got other Christian buzzwords that kind of go along with saved, accept Christ, uh, or to make a profession of faith uh, in Jesus. And our hope, it is, it is the point A that we're going to be talking about today. So our hope, if that isn't you, if you haven't made it to A, is that you would take a step toward A. Our hope is that you would do something. We'll have some folks in the prayer room after the service if you want to talk to one of them about maybe making a decision to take that step. They'd love to talk to you. I'll be at the Connect booth. I'd love to talk to you. Maybe you're thinking you want to come by the Connect booth because you've made that decision privately, but you haven't made it publicly, and you want to take the step of baptism. So our hope is that you would make that step to get to point A, because that's where I want to talk to folks today. For, so for the rest of the time, I'm going to talk to all the saved people in the room. All right? We're going to talk to, about uh, what it means to get from point A to point B. Uh, it, it, so if you're not there yet, if you're not at point A, you can still do everything that I'm going to talk about. It's just that this passage was written on the assumption that people had already made that decision because this is a letter to a church. I don't know if they would have described themselves as a church. They were a community of very new Christians in a community called Philippi. And today we call this letter the letter to the Philippians. I don't know if they had a sign out that said the Philippian church, like we have a mountaintop church sign, but that's kind of the way we refer to them today. But they were just a fledgling, small community of believers. 
And the Apostle Paul is, writes this letter to them to help them figure out how to get from A to B, how to get from believing in Jesus, they're Christians, they're followers of Christ, to become something different. Now, what would, what would that be? A word we might use is a disciple. Or as Pastor Bill Elder, our founding pastor, says a lot, and I've used this language myself, a, a deeply devoted follower of Jesus. Not just a follower, a deeply devoted follower of Jesus, a committed disciple, that person that you look at and say, oh man, I wanna be them when I grow up, when my faith is mature. What Paul would say, if Paul titled this little thing, it's like not just to be like anybody, it's like this is how to be like Jesus when you grow up. And listen to the presumption of salvation that Paul starts this passage at. It's in Philippians chapter two, and we're gonna read for the first few verses. If you don't have a Bible, take one out at our uh, stands as you leave on our bookshelves right as you go out. We'd love to give that to you. This is what Paul says. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if, help me out here, any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, if anything, here's what Paul would say, if Jesus has made any difference in your life, like anything, if, if, there, if you have received any compassion from being united with Christ, if, you have, if it has made any difference in your heart, in your soul, if you have been received any encouragement from Christ, really what Paul is saying, if you have been saved, like if you have had an experience where you knew that Jesus was real in your life, it, if it has made any difference to you, and then he follows it up with a really important word, then, now that's important because what, what that means is what comes next is a response to what Christ has already done. It's really important. If Jesus has made any difference in your life, if you've received any encouragement, any tenderness, any compassion, you remember that whole list he had, then, and whatever comes next means whatever I write next is a response to what Christ has already done. You see, what he doesn't write there is the word because. See, remember I said a lot of people think that the word there is because. A lot of people think that I get encouragement from Christ, I get attention from God, I get God's favor because of what I've done or because I do good things or because I volunteer or because of whatever it is I do. And there, it's just totally different. That's why, that's why I said that I need to start at point A if you've received Christ today, if you, have, if you are saved, because the presumption that Paul makes is the then. If you have received anything from Christ, it's not because, then, and then listen to what he says. This. So then, this is the response. If any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then, Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the spirit and of one mind. So what Paul says is that a community characterized by salvation in Christ, by unity in Christ, the trademark of it is this unification, this like-mindedness. Now, that doesn't mean you're exactly alike. That doesn't mean you don't cheer for different teams. It doesn't mean that you don't vote differently. It doesn't mean that you don't have different convictions and different values and different ideas. What Paul says is that you should have a like-mindedness, and here is what the like-mindedness is like. Here's what this is, where we are unified. And this is, this is, pretty, this is pretty dramatic, pretty radical. Here's the like-mindedness that you could have. No matter what, I'm not, Paul's not saying to you, I'm not telling you you can't disagree. I'm not telling you you're gonna all be alike, but we should all share this like-mindedness as a response to what Christ has already done. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, and read this with me, value others above yourselves and looking to not, not looking to your own interests, but each of you 
to the interest of others. Paul says that vanity and selfishness and self-centeredness and doing things for me, me, me is not part of the life of a follower of Christ. Now, I don't think any of us are selfish on purpose, right? I mean, most of us don't have this thought, you know, I need to do something really selfish today. So let me see, what could I do? <laughs> or I really want to be self-centered today. I don't, I don't think, I think that it just kind of happens. And in fact, I think this has infiltrated the American church in a really subtle way. And I think it's infiltrated the American church in a subtle way through a term that you may not know because it's a, minister, it's a minister's term. So this is kind of like pastoral world. So I'm going to pull the, I'm going to pull the curtain back here on kind of some things that, that pastors are talking about, thinking about, trying to figure out. And it's this term called consumer Christianity. Now, you may not have ever, that may be a completely new, if you're just a normal church person, that's, that's probably not a term you think about or you, t or you think through or look. It's a terrible ep epidemic. And I have a confession to you. It's my fault. Well, it's not all my fault, but I'm just part of the reason. It's my fault. It's pastor's fault. It's leader's fault. We didn't mean to. We just accidentally created it. Because we had an idea that maybe we should create churches with consumers in mind. So here's what we figured out. People like going to shopping malls. Did you know that? They don't like to go to big, intimidating buildings with steeples on top of them. So we built churches that look more like shopping malls than look like European cathedrals. Here's something we figured out. It annoys consumers and people, that little sign on doors to sanctuaries and churches that you probably grew up with that says no food or drink in the sanctuary. Anybody remember one of those signs? Like y'all trying to act like y'all don't know that? Y'all know those signs? Like when you go visit mom and daddy, you go visit there and it's got that sign, right? And we just figured out, you know what? What if we just did the opposite? What if we served the best coffee that we could afford and said, bring your coffee on in? We figured out that people would rather sit in comfy, cushiony seats than hard wooden pews. Amen? I mean, do y'all want to put hard wooden pews in or y'all like the comfy seats? Right? We figured out, did you know this? Classical music is not on top 40 radio. So we ditched robes and classical music and made our worship music sound more like top 40 music because we figured out that's what people wanted. And so we, we created all this and we did it to reach a culture that churches weren't reaching. We did it to break down the barriers to share an unchanging message of hope and grace of just what I talked about earlier, that this amazing grace is free and all you have to believe. And we just believed if we could tear down all the, the, the traditional Christian kind of stuff that was getting in the way in church world, that we could reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And guess what? We were right. In fact, you don't know this because you're not a pastor and you don't care about stuff like this. But there is a magazine for church leaders called Outreach Magazine. And they put out a list every year of the fastest 100 growing churches in America and the largest 100 churches in America. There's some, there's some crossover on the list. It usually ends up, you know, there's 20, 30 that are on one list that aren't on the other because you could be a fast growing church and not be a huge church. But guess what? I looked this again this week. It's something I look at from time to time just to see what's happening in, in, in Christianity. Almost every church on the list is modeled after the kind of model we have here at Mountaintop. Almost every one of them 
is modeled after in, in a, with a heartbeat to reach out, to tear down the barriers, to tear down all the cultural things so that we could reach more people. And I believe, I really believe this, that this is a part of one of the greatest spiritual awakenings in America. When church leader says that we're going to put, that we are not interested in helping people adapt to a tradition, we are interested in throwing out all traditions so that they can get the one message that matters, that Jesus loves loves you and died for you. I love it. I am all about it. But it's, it can be tricky and dangerous because it's so shiny and pretty and the seat's so comfy and the free coffee was so nice and the band was so slick, and you're like, dang, that was better than what I heard in the club on Friday night. <laughs> that it can be so easy to just come and watch a service performed by professional Christian staff members and leave. And if we don't lead well and teach well, and I'm talking about when I say we, I mean, pe I mean me, I mean from my seat. If pastors don't teach well and lead well and disciple people well, then we will help people get to point A and become Christians, but we will create consumer Christians. And my problem with it is Jesus didn't say to go and make consumer Christians who are really good at coming and watching services. He said, go. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey what I have taught. So Paul would say, listen, if you're doing it out of, if there's any kind of selfishness in this, then, because here's, here's what culture, consumer Christianity, this is what it looks like. When you follow Jesus, but ask what the church can do for you instead of asking what you can do for the church so that others may follow Jesus. That, come on, let me try that one more time. When you follow Jesus, but you ask what the church can do for you, why won't you start this ministry for my age group? Why won't you get a staff position for my stage of life? Why don't you do this event because I want to do this event? Why won't you support what my small group wants to do? Why won't you do this? Pastor, why don't you do this? Staff leader, why won't you do this? Why won't you meet my needs? Because, you know, I've been here a long time, and I give a lot of money, and I'm there every single Sunday. Instead of asking, Pastor, what can I do to help the church? Staff leader what can I do to help your ministry what can I do how can I serve what can I give what support that you need so that others may follow the Jesus that I received so freely well that's a, that's a big difference see here's the deal if a church is filled with too many consumers they will literally consume the church until there's nothing left that's what consumers do they just consume. Paul says, be a producer. Don't do things out of selfish ambition. Put others above yourself. Well, what does that look like? Glad you asked. This is what Paul said. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So Paul would say, hey, listen, I'm glad you've got an uncle or a small group leader that you say you want to be like when you grow up. I want, this is how you're like Jesus when you grow up. This is what you do. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Now let me just, let me flesh that out for you just a second. Here's what he's saying. Who? The apostle John wrote that Jesus was God and was with God in the beginning. Paul later wrote in another, in another letter that Jesus, that by him all things were made and through him all things were made. That means that when God was there at the beginning of Genesis, Jesus is him, in him, and with him. That when he made in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that was Jesus that did that. In the beginning, when all the animals were made, that was Jesus who did that. And what Paul writes is Jesus did not use his position as the king of kings and glory, Lord of lords to use to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. 
being made in human likeness. He left all that king of creation to become one of us where our knees hurt sometime. And you get a headache. And that shoulder just don't feel right. You ever think about that? You ever think Jesus ever woke up in the morning and thought, my shoulder don't feel right. Why did I do this, right? I left glory for this who became one of us. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So let me sum this up for you. What Paul says is if Jesus has had any impact on your life, then follow his example and serve. Or let me say it a better way. Saved people serve. So I said I need to talk to the saved people. You remember what Paul said? Do we need to go back? Any encouragement, any compassion, any t- if, you've, if Jesus has made any difference in your life, then have the same mind of Christ who took the very nature, who did not consider his position to be something to use for his own advantage, but instead became a servant. Saved people serve because Jesus served, because we want to follow the example of Jesus, because we want to be like our Savior, because we want to follow him. We serve because we realize that our faith is incomplete and there's something missing if we don't do it. Your faith will atrophy if you don't use it. Sitting in church isn't enough. I'm friend, I'm glad you're here. But you will not get from point A to point B in that comfy chair. So I've got a crazy idea. What if you just served? Like so next week, behind you in the hallway, we're gonna have a serve team sign up fair. In the hallway, and then our groups will be in the atrium, small groups. We want, I want to challenge you to sign up for both. Next week I'm going to talk about relationships and why groups matter. And you've got all that information here in this book. And this is radical, but simple. Like what if you just served? All kinds of ways to serve. Greeters, traffic team, children's ministry, student ministry, coffee bar, Uh, media team. We even have a group of mostly men that get here early on Sunday mornings. You you, you might not even know this. Get here early on Sunday mornings to flip some of our kids' rooms from a day school room for Monday through Friday to a children's ministry room on Sunday mornings. They mostly move furniture and put out rugs. They call themselves the rug rats. You could be a rug rat for Jesus. That's uh, that's our marketing. We we should get t-shirts. Can we get t-shirts for the rug rats? What if you just served? What if you signed up to serve? Because this, is, this would be your attitude. To say, because Christ died for me, it's the least I can do. Because Christ died for me, the least I can do is be a greeter. Because Christ died for me, the least I can do is helping kids ministry. Because Christ died for me, the least I can do is move some rugs. Because Christ died for me, the least I can do is get here early to make some coffee because Christ died for me. If you want to get from point A to point B, you might be at point A, you might be stuck at point A simply because you, you, you've thought of that growing your faith was just about knowing more when it might actually be doing more. You might be stuck on point A because you've been in a rut, because you've been serving in the same ministry for 12 years and it's kind of gotten easy and routine. It might be time for you to change. It might be time for you to try something new. It might be time for you to stretch a little bit out of your comfort zone. Now, here, now here's the deal. I know what some of you are thinking. This is all just a ploy to guilt you into volunteering because we need more volunteers, right? That's what some of you are thinking. I, I just believe what this book says. And I believe what Paul writes, that we will find purpose and calling when we are like Jesus, And that to find that purpose and calling, to become like our Savior, then we need to put others ahead of ourselves. And I think when you show up early so you can get there at the front door and be a greeter, or show up early so you can make coffee, or show up early so you can make sure the camera shot is just right, or show up early because uh, you got to move some rugs, or show up early to do whatever it is that you serve, stand out in the cold and wave people into the traffic, I think that you're putting others above yourself. 
And I think that'll be good for your soul. I think when you change another baby's diaper who isn't related to you, you don't do that out of selfish ambition, okay? Can I just say that? Like, I didn't like changing my own baby's diapers. So no one does it. And I think if you do things that aren't out of selfish ambition but are instead of selflessness, I think it'll be good for your soul. I think if you give up an hour and say, I'm going to get here early at 930 and teach nine-year-olds at 930 and worship at 1115, or I'm going to worship at 930 and teach kids at 1115, I think you're putting others above yourself. You're putting their interests first because you could be doing a million other things. And I think it'll be good for your soul. Save people, serve people. Save people, serve, because we want to be like Jesus. What if we were all producers? And I want to tell you why this matters. Because God's got big dreams for this church. Big. We talk a lot about like, oh man, we want to move those curtains back one day. And I think God's like, well, is that as big as it gets? I think God thinks, well, like what if we blew out the walls? I mean, like, is that as big as your vision? Is just like move the curtains? I think God would be like, well, why don't we move the curtains like three times a Sunday and then blow out the walls and then have campuses all across Birmingham and then have campuses all across Alabama and maybe out of state. Not because Mountaintop wants to be big, because we've got a message that every other church in the world has and God needs all of us to do better at reaching more people from Jesus because there's 8 billion people on planet Earth and we all want them to know that Jesus died for them. And I want to tell you, we will never be able to hire enough staff to reach our city. We will need an army of volunteers to do it. And if you say you want our church to grow and you want our church to reach others, the best thing you can do is sign up to serve because the sermon starts in the parking lot. And Every experience that a newcomer experiences preaches a message long before I preach the message. If it's confusing where they should park, we just preached a message. If there's no one at the front door or the people at the front door don't even smile and say hello because they're talking about the football game or what happened on Friday night, we just preached a message. If the coffee is not good, we just preached a message. If the camera angle is all messed up, we just preached a message. If it's chaos checking in your children, we just preached a message. If there's a word misspelled on the screen, we just preached a message. Everything we do preaches a message before we preach the message. And what if we said we want to pre help preach a message so that if God were to give Carter the message that somebody needs to hear, we would have lit the way for brothers and sisters to hear it. We want to have a culture of serving at Mountaintop, not just because we want you to serve, because if you don't serve, you can't be like Jesus, and you can't find your purpose. Because Jesus didn't find his purpose on the throne at the right hand of God. He found his purpose on a cross. And you won't find your purpose in that comfy brown seat. I want you to serve, not because we need volunteers, even though that's true. I want you to serve not because it'll help us reach more people, even though that's true. I want you to serve because I want you to get from point A to point B to be a godly servant. And godly servants don't have clean hands. And they don't have dirty hands or even calloused hands. Godly servants have nail-scarred hands. And this is the model for what the hands of a servant look like. Saved people serve because it's the least we can do for a Savior who served all the way to the cross. Heavenly Father, Lord, as a pastor and leader, I have to confess to you sometimes that it's so, it's complicated. <laughs> 
our heart, Lord, is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we work hard to take down the barriers to do that. Lord, forgive me that sometimes it's easy for us to create a culture that leaves people right there. And Lord, I pray for brothers and sisters in the room this morning who don't know you, hadn't made a decision. I hope they will see that it's so easy to get to point A. But for those of us that are saved, that are followers of Jesus, that have made a profession of faith, Lord, convict our hearts that we were never meant to stay there. Call us. Give us a purpose, God. Convict us for that ministry area that we serve, not just to fill a volunteer team, but to say, by doing so, I'm going to put the needs of somebody else above mine. I'm going to give them that hour. I'm going to give them that getting up early. I'm going to give them this, this energy that I've got because I'm tired of it being all about me. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.